Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming. So it's interesting that you may have seen me talk before, and I usually seem to be talking about the future trends. But over a year ago, I read a government report, which was um, which I will refer to here, which was talking about the preparedness of businesses for uh, cyber incident response. So it's, uh, it, it, I'm, I believe I'm unmuted. Okay. So what this report basically said was that although organizations were spending a lot of money on prevention, uh, very few had a proper incident response plan. Now, so this seemed to strike a chord with me because nowadays it's no longer a question of if you are going to be, um, uh, shall we say, attacked. It's a question of when. So as a result of that, in Coppinger Coal, we developed a couple of boot camps which was intended to take people through uh, what responding to a cyber incident um, involves. And those are whole day boot camps, which um, uh, are too long really to sort of give you here. In any case, I understand that you as an audience are more mostly auditors or risk professionals rather than cyber incident responders. So from the perspective of the IT audit and from the perspective of general risk management, you really should be thinking about what kind of plan you have and how you would judge that plan. And hopefully I will give you some hints in this. So first of all, Coppinger Coal is an analyst and we do lots of things. And as I frequently say, we have two queues of people who come to us. One, are, one is vendors who want us to believe that their products are the next best thing since sliced bread. And the other, are, the other queue is of end users who can't believe what the vendors are telling them and don't know what to do. So basically, uh, we try to moderate between those two things. But today, what I'm going to do is to talk about the conflict between the way in which organizations are engaged in a race towards digital transformation, where they are uh, see the benefits in terms of reduced costs, greater contact with their customers, and so forth, but have not thought through the consequences in terms of what happens if you are attacked from a cyber perspective and um, what does this do uh, to your reputation and your costs. So how should you prepare for a cyber incident? And we've got the 10 step plan. I don't know how that corresponds to Alcoholics Anonymous and other things like this, but basically, you know, we have a 10-step plan of what you should be doing. And finally, we're going to have a summary. So to begin with, what we see is we as a, an analyst have all these customers coming to us, telling us they're going through digital transformation. And what they're going to do is they're going to use big data. They're going to move everything to the cloud where there's going to be flexible development, which they'll outsource to somebody who will then create very quickly and at a very low cost offshore a set of applications that will connect them to their customers so they can do e-commerce, they can find out what their customers want and all this kind of stuff. And they can reduce costs, they can transform and create new products, and they can empower their employees as well as um, making uh, their operations more efficient. But the trouble is that if you do that, if you have a cyber attack, what it does is it immediately wipes out all of these different things. And unless you have thought through the consequences of that, you may well find yourself unprepared. So for example, what organizations are doing is they're saying, well, we're going to use chatbots. And in fact, I now find I ring 
a helpline for any of the large organizations, British Gas or whatever. And what happens is you find yourself talking to a machine. Well, I can recognize it. It's a chatbot. And basically what they've done is they've said, well, if we put these chatbots there, most people ring up with inconsequential things that even a chatbot can answer. So we'll just get that to do it. And then we can cut down our customer service team. We can cut down our call center. But what happens if that doesn't, if that breaks, then you're left without that. If you have a business process, which you used to have, which was slow, arduous, and used pencil and paper, or, or people passing pieces of paper around, or whatever, and you automate it, great, you've saved money. But what happens if that process doesn't work? And indeed, I remember the air traffic control systems, and maybe they're still like this, but when they first automated, them, they actually ran constantly, because of the safety considerations, they ran two systems in parallel. There was always what were effectively little cards which represented aeroplanes and, and their position, and those cards were moved at the same time as the instructions were given to the computer. So if the computer crashed, at least they had a picture of how things were working. And uh, I actually, on one occasion when I was flying to, the, to America, I happened to be sitting next to a pilot who was a pilot on a rotation, and we got talking about these things. And I for those of you that have been through uh, north of the Arctic Circle, you move into an area which is known as compass unreliable. And this is a big challenge because the the ordinary navigation aids that you have tend to become poorer and poorer. And he was so paranoid that he said when he flies this route, he insists that although he's got a cockpit full of electronic navigation aids, every 20 minutes or every 10 minutes, he plots where they are on a map and what their speed is because he on one occasion had a total electrical failure when he was north of Greenland and he said when he finally passed over the coast, he was delighted that he was only 200 miles away from where he thought he was. So this business of using technology is, is excellent, but you need to think about what would happen if it doesn't work. So just to look at one of the challenges we have, that I have gone to CISOs, or to organizations and said, if you say, what is your critical um, business system? Well, first of all, asking them what their critical business system is, is, is an, an illustrative question because sometimes you get a very unconvincing answer. But if they do know what their critical business system is, you then say, well, how long will your business survive if that doesn't work? So they then will give you an answer. And, and I have, I, on some people that have said that they've done this digital transformation, they're saying, well, if our e-commerce system goes down for more than two minutes, we're in deep trouble because people will be going somewhere else. We're going to be losing business. So you then say, okay, well, you've got this system and where does it run? Well, that's interesting because they say, well, what we've actually got, some of it's running in the cloud, and we've got this connection to a payment system over here, and we've got uh, an on-premises financial system connected to it. Okay, so can you show me the SLAs that prove to me that the availability that you've just described is supported by all of those SLAs? And that's complex because, first of all, you have this technology stack which ranges from being sort of the data center, which could be struck by lightning, right up to the data that, that, that is sitting uh, and upon which your business depends. The next thing is <clears throat> that in most of the modern hybrid world, you find that there's a shared responsibility for all of this. So simply saying who is responsible for what 
for what particular component can be uh, incredibly complex to work out and to actually figure out from the SLAs what it is that, that, that you should have. And then on top of this, you've got to overlay your cyber response. And that you'll see is based on the NIST um, cyber security framework, the five principles of NIST. And each of those components has different responsibilities uh, for those different bits of, of, of the things. And so apart from everything else, the, the, the technology stack and the, the IT delivery model makes it more and more difficult. So this government report that I um, uh, looked at, which was the UK uh, Cybersecurity Breaches 2018 survey, comes up with this interesting thing, which is that 90% of the budget that organizations are spending is on prevent. Well, that's good because prevent is a good thing. You know, it's better to prevent, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as they say. But only 13% of these organizations said they had some kind of a cyber incident response plan. And given that you become more dependent upon your IT services and given that it's almost certain that you are going to be attacked at some point, that doesn't sound like a particularly good idea. So I, I tried to look for some uh, understanding of where this had come from. And maybe how many of you have come across the cyber, NIST cyber framework? Good, you've all come, or most of you have come across it. So this is a good idea. And many organizations have now adopted this. So I went and counted, because those are the so-called NIST core functions. If you then look at the subcategories, there are 29 subcategories for identify, 39 for uh, protect, or I think that should be protect, not prevent, 18 for detect, 15 for respond, and only six for recover. And so it's not surprising people through that are driven to, because they say, well, we'll do all this. That's where your money's going to go. But nevertheless, this, these six things are going to be key when um, uh, it, the, the, the so-called hits the fan. So here's some of the examples. Now, some of these things were not, if you will, a direct cyber attack. I mean, you've come across Telegram and the Telegram story. Well, Telegram is a Russian um, messaging system. And the Russian government uh, wanted to be able to control and to read the, uh, the messages that were being sent. Uh, and they didn't want them to encrypt it. And Telegram didn't like this. So they sort of said, well, stuff you, and moved on and uh, opened up, a, if you will, a, a service under the covers. And so the Russian government then went after the IP addresses for that. And so they kept reinventing this service on Amazon Web Services with different IP addresses. And eventually, the Russian government sort of managed to block so many of the Amazon Web Services IP addresses in the Russian Federation that, in fact, they started to bring the banks offline, the financial services offline, and large businesses offline. So the collateral damage from uh, what was effectively a, uh, a, a service that was trying to avoid government control led to the breach of, uh, the, the breach of service to many other organizations. And then many of you will have been aware of this, which again, wasn't, this wasn't a cyber attack. This was the O2. Now that was, that, but it was cyber related because O2 depended upon infrastructure from Ericsson's and Ericsson's had uh, certificates and Ericsson's for one reason or another um, failed to renew the certificate or keep the certificate up to date and one day it expired and this brought out 
all of the Ericsson's backbone that lay behind the O2 service. And <laughs> apart from not being able to make phone calls, any of the Internet of Things that depended upon that stopped working. And again, uh, that was a consequence. Now, the, the last one that I want to talk about is Norsk Hero. Who's come across the Norsk Hero story? Okay, one of you. Norsk Hero. What, what is, do you know what Norsk Hero is? It's an aluminium smelter. It makes aluminium. And one day, everybody turned up at work and it basically said, do not switch your computer on. Now, like many Scandinavians, they had invested heavily in state-of-the-art um, uh, process control, all controlled by computers. And they had a ransomware attack. And that ransomware attack had basically disabled all of the computer systems that were uh, the system depended upon. So that's kind of a bit of a problem because if you are making aluminium, you know, you've got these things that if they get too hot, they'll melt. And if they cool down, they will set solid. And when they set solid, that is it. A, an aluminium smelting plant like, uh, shall we say, a steel processing plant, um, a Bessemer furnace, if it ever stops, you have to demolish it and start again. So they had a big problem. And, well, I don't know whether they had a full plan, but basically what they had to do was they went to all the retired employees who remembered how you ran aluminium processing, aluminium smelting plants before you had the computers. <laughs> and the, all the retired employees came in and they managed to keep the plant going while they were able to restore the service from uh, the, the ransomware. And being Scandinavians, they were not going to be, um, uh, shall we say, ransomed, uh, blackmailed into paying the, the ransom. So they, they had to recover everything by bringing it back from nothing. And it took weeks. So that's why you need to be ready. And just to kind of make sure there isn't any, uh, any doubt, here are the, the reasons that I believe. First of all, the problem is that, you know, when you say that 43% of the organization surveyed in a year suffered some kind of a cybersecurity breach, then that means it's almost even chance that your organization is going to suffer from one. And that the message has got through that most organizations are now saying that cybersecurity is an important issue, but yet only 27% of businesses said they had a formal incident response plan. And many of them, when you say to them, have you tested it? They'll say, yes. And you say, how did the test go? Oh, it failed. <laughs> and that's unfortunately... The, the situation. So why you need it is if you don't have one, you are probably going to damage your customer by failing to respond because you will not be very well thought of if you lose people's data and don't have a proper process for how you're going to deal with it that is going to cost you in loss of revenue and possibly in financial penalties and it's also going to lead to all kinds of internal communication problems when that happens, if you haven't thought about how you are going to do it. And just to look at the communications aspect of things, um, if you remember GDPR, which we're now got to call because we're all good British citizens soon to be again, um, uh, we, we've got our own Data Protection Act, the 2018 Data Protection Act. So you have a lot of communications and things that you need to do around that. So how do you meet this challenge? Well, a lot of cyber security stuff has been focused on the so-called cyber kill chain. And absolutely, we must 
do our best to prevent things. But we also need to pay attention to what we do when we respond. And auditors need to not only think about the risk of the cyber attack, but also the risk of having a poor process for recovering. And in fact, there are a lot of steps in this. You need to have a team. That team needs to be empowered through the organization. There is a great need for communication, and indeed I hope to be able to show you a short video about that. And however you look at it, I live in, uh, I live in Stockport, which is not very far from the Toddington uh, Dam that burst uh, last summer, if, if, if you remember. And so I know the people that were around there, but if you watched what actually happened when that incident occurred, you could almost sort of plot it against this. And just to give you an, the detection, the detection was a local priest whose, whose house, vicarage, overlooked the dam, saw what he saw, thought was quite unusual. The water was cascading over. So he rings up and says, there's water coming over the top of the dam. Well, is this an incident? <laughs> well, it turned out it was absolutely critical to know that because it was washing away the surface of the dam. Then what do you do to contain it? And again, in the Toddington Dam, you, you had the problem, well, you, you can't leave the people there because they're going to be killed. And it was people, you know, people were sort of saying, well, we were told it was, we live five minutes away. <laughs> When it goes, we have five minutes to get out. And how are you going to stop it from getting worse? Then how are you going to remove the problem? And well, they haven't, still haven't really removed the problem, but they have managed to protect things. So all of those stages are involved. So what we're going to do is to look at some of those stages. And depending on the amount of time we have, I may uh, ask you to do things. Now, this is interesting because this is the example that I gave you of the Toddington Dam. You're, you're just a help desk or something. Or, in fact, you may even be sitting at your desk as a, an auditor and the press get hold of these numbers. So your phone rings and it's a member of the press. And they say, we've heard that you've got a data breach because there's all this stuff going on on social media. What are you going to do? How would you respond to that? Do you actually have a, do you have a, a, a policy that you've, you've told your employees of what to, what to say if the press ring up? Many organizations don't. So, you know, what, 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 what should you do? Anybody got any guesses? Well, it's interesting, and the, an the answer is that without giving anything away, the best thing you can do is to find out because it, it, it might be for you, but it's actually an opportunity because you can say things like, oh, that's interesting. What have you heard? What, what, what are people saying has happened? Who's saying this has happened? So that the, the best thing to do is to collect as much data as you can. And uh, it, it, if, if one of these things tells you something, then you, you need to immediately start collecting data. And this is really important. People, people are tempted to say, oh, yeah, well, there's a data breach. We'll get on it. Well, the moment you say there is a data breach publicly, you start the clock on, uh, on these privacy legislations so you've now, the moment you've said that, you've just set off 72 hours or whatever it is you've got in order to do something. So when this then happens, when this message comes through, what are you going to do with it? Now, somebody rings you up and says, there is water coming over the top of the dam. Is that actually 
a crisis? How do you know whether it's a crisis? When somebody says to you, well, it looks like I've got a virus on my computer, or as what actually happened with us in our company, somebody said, I got this peculiar email, I clicked on it, and it wanted all my credentials, and I gave them. <laughs> what do you do? How do you decide? <laughs> This is, these are the questions that we pose to the people in our workshop. And, you're, you, you know, ideally you come along with your playbook or your plan, which says when something like that happens, we have a process. And that process is called triage, where you have a predefined way of deciding whether something needs what level of action? You know, is it a single computer that's down? Is this evidence that there is a, uh, a, a, a problem of a virus that is spreading throughout the organization? Is data actually leaking at the moment? So do you, does your organization, does your process have a way of deciding the importance of events? If you don't have a way of deciding the importance of events, then the first thing that's going to happen is people cannot coordinate their response at the right level. And so um, that then takes you on. So if, if you have got a crisis, then who is involved in that crisis? Who is responsible? Who, who do you call? You know, is it Ghostbusters? Who, who is it you call if, if there is a crisis? And in that, do you have an organizational structure? Do you have a set of organizational parameters that say you know who is involved, who is responsible for what, who is accountable for what, who you have to communicate with, and who you inform? Now, again, this is not... Uh, it's interesting because up to now, I've not really talked about anything technical. You know, I mean, there is a perception that a, a cyber incident is primarily about people that understand the arcane things about networks and malware and so forth. But up to now, we've not got around to the point where we've invoked those people. We're just saying, as an organization, how are we going to do it? And so, you know, this is our old good friend, Raki. Unless you can actually say who the people are involved, what their responsibilities are, and I've worked this out in advance so that when you press the button, the book opens and people know what they've got to do, you're, you're, in, you're in trouble. And so here's my suggestion, and in, indeed one of the things we, we get our people to do, uh, the people in our boot camps to do, is to say, in your organization, who are the people? Do you have a predefined list of these people? Do you have their responsibilities defined? And so one of the interesting things is most people forget about the victim, which is, which is the customers. They, they, they immediately start talking about their own staff. But one of the, the questions is, who are the people that have been involved? Because they're going to be involved to some extent. And if you look, you can see by the magic of colors, you know, I've related uh, primary responsibilities. So, for example, typically what you need to have is you need to have a team leader. You need to have a leader of whatever actions you are going to take. Now, that may be the, the CISO, but usually isn't because the CISO is involved but the CISO is, if you will, the person who provides the, the umbrella, provides the power to the team to do what they have to do by having programmed this out and having informed the various, uh, the various people. And I talk to CISOs and they'll say, well, I, I was just uh, back in my hotel on a business trip, having had a good meal and a few drinks when I get this call which is, 
you know, we've got an incident. And at that point, you, you aren't necessarily in a state to do something about it, but you've got to have had a, a delegated line of, 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 con, uh, of, of accountability and responsibility. And so uh, some of the things that you may not think about are, first of all, <coughs> that we're going to talk about what happens when the lines of business get involved in this, because they aren't necessarily going to be terribly impressed. And uh, you also almost certainly need to involve your legal counsel, but you don't need to be led by your legal, legal counsel because you've got to make sure you don't do things that are illegal, but you've got to be careful that the legality does not in itself become the dominant reason for you taking particular actions. And uh, in a moment, we'll discuss how important communication is. Sorry, Mike. What's an LOB manager? Line of business. Thank you. Line of business. Because the line of business is, is the ones that say, look, we're going to lose the money. You can't turn it all off. <laughs> so you need a rocky table and a, an organization chart. And this is, uh, oh, I just pressed the wrong thing. There we are. So then you've got this challenge which is these things don't necessarily become manifest at times that are, shall we say, most convenient to you. So how do you find the people? Do they have a, do you have a contact sheet? Do you have a, a rule that says you have to contact them? I mean, when I was a, 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 a vice president of the development at CA, I was actually the third line that when all else failed, they would ring me up and I had to have my mobile phone on 24 hours a day wherever I was. And people would ring me up saying, there is a, you know, it's all gone wrong. What are we going to do? Well, I couldn't mend it, but I had to have a system that said, this is what we do about it. So you need to understand who is involved, how you bring them together. You need to have a rule book that says what they can do because it, it's almost certain that they are not going to be able to simply follow the uh, organizational processes. Um, when I worked for another company, the, this company was constantly trying to sort of pair costs. And this was in the 1970s. And um, uh, what happened was they said, oh, there's all these people flying around the world on our company policy. And so they're all just enjoying themselves. What we're going to do is the only way you can get a, an air ticket is with the chief financial officer signing it off. And so this little voice piped up from the back. So that means he's going to have a telex in his bedroom. Well, why is that? Well, it's because we support Papua New Guinea from our Brisbane office. <laughs> and we, we have a four hour service level response time which means that when the customer in Papua New Guinea says that we've got a problem, we're going to have to put that engineer on a plane within a couple of hours. And that means your man in England is going to have to sign it off. Well, that, that scotched that particular thing. But you see what I am saying. So you need to have a way of assembling the team. The next thing is setting clear objectives. And there is this wonderful concept, I think it comes from the military, of what is called the leader's intent. And the leader's intent is a very simple, straightforward, short sentence. You know, and the example that is often given is in D-Day. You know, obviously, when you were invading France in D-Day, the idea was at the end you were going to defeat Germany and get to Berlin or whatever. But the guys that were at D-Day, their objective was take the beach. It was as simple as that. It wasn't a thousand words. It was take the beach. So you've got to give this team a set of objectives that are like that. And they've got to be clearly defined. Now, this is the bit where we're going to try and make the video work. And this is a man called Richard Bell, who was in fact the security uh, officer for London Transport. He's now um, uh, 
uh, runs a, a business and he spoke at one of our conferences on this subject. And if we're lucky, we'll make it work. Do you want to go elsewhere? Yeah. It's all right, but he says he's not bad. I'll continue that mantra, but please don't feel bad for me in, the, in this next bit. I have no shame. I've made my peace with it, but it is a car crash waiting to happen. You just never know when the media are going to turn up. Well, we have been lighter. Um, we haven't got um, a cause of it at the moment. There's medical um, issues which have um, come up uh, in failure. Um, we brought him on to it, uh, a cousin, and um, hopefully I'll have uh, some proper funding from you in the next hours. Stop! Walk away! Stop! Now walk away! Just walk away! Who's the people at Oxford Circuit in Victoria? Are many people think it's a safety issue now? Uh, well, there's, there's no indication that there's anything safety critical. I mean, the service is still running. Obviously, it will have an impact on um, uh, allowing our customers to be able to uh, use uh, the tool for uh, the weapon purposes. But uh, I'm sure we'll be able to have all of those customers that uh, we're allowed uh, to. Stop talking! Just stop talking! They should be able to use. Um, uh, most, most of the system will be there. Now, I really don't know what I'm talking about. With, with anything like this, because uh, we've got to be like to have uh, uh, an amount of revenue, um, but it's important that we keep In my mind, I'm saying I want to die. Two hours with no contact list, so what kind of revenue are you talking about? I mean, you've got to be taxpayers' revenue, isn't it? Well, it's taxpayers' revenue in the sense that they obviously pay um, to. Um, now I'm just making it up. Trying to look for an exit, can't find one. But um, we're, uh, we're looking to investigate that and try and come back with a full comment on all yeah. aspects of this. Well, oh, so I'm right. told that their banks, uh, it's nothing to do with their banks, but they have been charged when they've swiped their contact list slot, even though they are supposed to can't use them. So how quickly will they get their money back? At this stage, it's too early to say. I mean, obviously, we're in contact with our, our bank partners. Will you just shut up, man? So you don't know when contact will be able to run in, and you don't know when people will get their money back. Don't know a lot. Don't know a lot. Need to go. Mom! So we're two minutes now. We're about two minutes. The best bit's coming. Okay. Managing the media. Right. I'm going to try and do something different. Right. <laughs> right. I don't know what's happened there, but uh, basically, um, can we move on to the next slide? <clears throat> so, <laughs> if we can do it without, without, without this. So the point about that is that if you do not understand what will happen when the press comes. You will get drawn into that. Everybody thinks that they wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. But in fact, this was a, a chap with a lot of experience who exposed what happened to him when he went to what was effectively media training. He turned up at the media training and that was the journalist and the journalist only wants five seconds of you being an idiot and they will keep talking to you as long as you keep answering now 
if you look again at the way when there is a terrorist attack or when there is one of these bad incidents, what happens is they're all around the police station. And usually at this point, the police don't really know for sure what's happened. So what they come out with is they come out with a very clear <coughs> statement. They say, yes, we know that something has happened. We have people there. We have a plan for this. And uh, we will let you know when we know any more. And that's it, goodbye, they walk away. And unless you have people who can professionally talk to the media like this, then you end up looking an idiot because what the five o'clock or the six o'clock news wants is they want 10 seconds of you, the organization, looking like an idiot. Not that they really, perhaps I'm being, shall we say, negative about the press, but, but that is what it appears. Uh, and so you need to be prepared for dealing with that. And you need to have a communications plan, which includes everything which, start, which starts with internal communication. It deals with how you are going to meet, brief the media, how you're going to do press interviews, how you deal with communicating with the customers, right down to statutory notification. And if you haven't got all that kind of stuff set up and the people that might be contacted by the press know what to do, <laughs> you end up with your CEO being ambushed as he comes into the office or she comes into the office. And you get members of staff being phoned up by the press who then are confounded about what to say. Now, having dealt with that, you then move on to the next question, which is the identification and con containment of this. And again, some of these things are taken from real life. That the first problem you have is you now need to be able to take all this data that you've got and say, what actually is happening in my systems? Where is it come from? Where is it spreading to? And at this point, you need to have the technical knowledge and the data to be able to do that. And it may well be that if you're a small company, you needed a partner. You needed a, an expert group of people to come and help you. And it is a very good idea to have set the contract up for that before you need it. And you pay them a retainer. Because if you suddenly phone up these different companies, you are now, um, shall we say, in a poor negotiating position to get a good deal. The second thing is, and this frequently happens, certainly I know of it happening in cases that we've come across, where the impact, the immediate impact of these conclusions are that in order to be able to prevent further problems, you're actually going to have to stop the operational systems. Think of Travelex. Now, who in the organization is concerned about this? It's the line of business manager, because the line of business manager, their whole incentive, their whole pay package and everything depends upon meeting certain sales targets and certain revenue targets. And the last thing they want to hear is that their systems are going to be turned off. And the more that your organization depends upon the IT to do this, the more likely they are to be able to uh, complain about it. And so you, as the team leader and as the team, have to have either the ability to get their consensus to what you're doing or the power to be able to say, we're going to do it. Um, otherwise, again, it's going to be another bun fight where you know what you need to do to protect the overall organization, but senior and important people within the organization are going to um, uh, complain about you. And at the same time, you have this problem that whilst you want to stop everything from running, you also probably want to collect forensic evidence because when you have time, 
you perhaps want to be able to find out the evidence that will stand up in a court of law to be able to figure out and identify who is responsible so that you can take action against them if they are in a place where action can be taken. So that, that's uh, the next step is to get rid of the problem. And this is, this is really uh, uh, the good bit from the point of view of the security technical people. What was the vulnerability that was behind this? Which malware was it and where is it spread to? Which accounts have been hijacked? And how are you going to restore them back to uh, so, some, some of the different things? Do you have the, configure, the correct configurations for the network? Because once the criminal has, the cyber criminal has got into your network, you, you don't know what they've changed. They could have changed any of the routers, they could have changed the, um, uh, the, the operating system configurations, the virtual machine managers and all this kind of thing. So you have to be able to identify all the things that have been changed and to remove the bits that um, you uh, are, 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 are able to. And at this point, this is again where there is an interesting uh, question comes up. Because who is responsible for changing the systems? Is it the CISO? Quite a silence. <laughs> oh, no, no, sorry, it's, it's the business. Exactly. And so what happens is the CIS, there's a big board meeting, and this is what has happened. There's a big board meeting. Where are we with this attack that's going on? And the CISO says, Well, I'm done. We've removed the vulnerabilities and we've got rid of the malware. And so they say, but are the systems operational? Oh, no, that's not my job. Because the CISO is responsible for removing the malware. It's IT operations that's responsible for bringing everything back. You, you know, if you are the security people, you cannot just walk into a room and say, I'm going to re-image re all of the applications and the application servers. And by the way, did you actually have images of them? Did you have the data? <laughs> and many organizations don't. They don't have golden masters. They don't have uh, a, a good version of the application that they know they can move to. They don't necessarily have a restorable configuration of all the network devices. And if you don't, you're kind of starting from scratch again. And on one occasion, there, there was a, an organization that we, uh, we came across, and they, they, they sort of said, well, you know, the, 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 the IT team more or less lived, ate, and slept in the, in, in the IT center for six weeks. And we were really pleased because that, that, that's, that's what it took to get the services back and running. And so if you haven't prepared with things like you know what the configurations are, you have these golden masters that you can revert to, you're in a problem. And uh, if, you, if you've been able to do it, you then need basically to be able to re-image the things that could have been badly affected you need to be able to retest what you have. And at that point, the retesting surely should include uh, something which tells you that uh, the vulnerabilities which were uh, previously exploited have been removed. And then you need to have probably upped your game for monitoring just to make sure that they don't come back. Because one of, the, one of the, the, the ways criminals work is they will give you a period of time that they think it will take you to restore things. And since they, you've been proved to be vulnerable in the past, that's when the point when they come back for a second bite on the cherry. <clears throat> so, and then of course, you have to deal with the, uh, 
the communication that you are obliged to deal with through um, the privacy laws and the other kinds of notification laws, which, which uh, as you can see here, you have things like you certainly within the uh, 2018 Data Protection Act, you have 72 hours to notify um, the, uh, the regulators, the ICO, and this kind of information to, to be able to provide it. Do you have a system for collecting it? Do you have a process for doing it? Does someone know what they have to do? And um, you also need to get this information to the, uh, to, the, um, uh, to, to the customers and within what's called a reasonable amount of time. And I've only picked on one of the regulations there. And there may well be multiple obligations that you need to satisfy. So you've now come to the end of this and you breathe a sigh of relief. This is a time when you should actually go around and review what worked. Did you have a plan? What of that plan actually worked? What didn't work? And what do you need to change? And with, uh, with that, you hopefully will have made it better the next time round. So in summary, we have this position where a lot of organizations are spending an awful lot of money on prevention, and yet this, the level of cyber risk has risen to such an extent that nearly it's a nearly even Stevens chance that your organization is going to suffer a cyber breach in the next 12 months. That's certainly good based on the evidence from that survey. And so if it's like 50% in a year that you're going to suffer a cyber breach, you really should have a plan for that. But most organizations, according to the survey that was done by the UK government, don't have a tested formal plan. And this is what that plan involves. And it's actually quite complicated. And unless you have a plan, you are putting yourself at a greater risk. And so if you are a cyber uh, professional, you should be making sure that you contribute to that plan. And if you're an auditor, then you should be looking for the existence of these plans within your organization. And uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you very much, everyone. And if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. Uh, we do have time for some. <laughs> we do have time for questions. Uh, obviously, we are recording this uh, today on the live stream. So if you have got a question, please put your hand up and I'll pop around with the microphone for you. <clears throat> Mike, thanks very much for that. It was very, very enjoyable and very informative. Um, when I read that government report, my very first reaction was one of great disappointment because we've been dealing with business continuity planning for the last 30 years, and this is just business continuity planning. It doesn't matter whether it's an attack or just <coughs> internal incompetence. We can talk about British Airways, we can talk about TSB, talk about RBS, all of them had incidents internally, not, a, not an outside attack, they couldn't actually deal with. Now, this is even worse because if they can't deal with an internal failure and they have got no plan to deal with an external attack, then I really do feel sorry for British industry in the next 12 months. Well, John, I have to agree with you. And this is why I started off this by saying, whilst I normally talk about the future, Here's a, a, a place where it's as though people have forgotten what we knew 20 and 30 years ago. Now, I will say that there is one dimension of a cyber attack that doesn't just fall within normal business continuity planning. Normal business continuity planning is about fallibilities of individual items, and you can usually deal with that through the N plus one. You know, you can have another data center, you can have two power supplies and all this kind of thing. But the problem with the cyber attack is that it will spread almost instant instantaneously over all replicated systems. So 
it, it adds an extra challenge from that perspective. But nevertheless, the process, the process that we all knew in the 1970s about how to have business continuity applies to this, and that really this should be part of organization's business continuity plan. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Yes. I think it's probably more of an observation than a question, but in terms of, you mentioned that having the plan, which is great, but it's really important that it isn't just shelfware gathering dust. The organization needs to understand what is in that plan, they need to practice it, they need to be able to instigate it when it's needed. I used to work in a utility and they regularly had incidents where they didn't have an exercise, where they would test people out. So then when we actually had one year where three biggies happened in the same year, two were data center failures, one was a, uh, in effect being locked out of our HQ building for a, a, a particular a fault there, everybody knew what to do. There's no panic, it all happens. So the key point is that people need to know what to do, not just have a plan sitting on a shelf. Yes, and I think that supports John's point, which is this isn't rocket science. It's well known how to do it. And your observation there, which is that it's not sufficient to say we have a plan, tick. It's got to be a plan that has been tested successfully. Okay, are we all done? I think so. Good, good. Okay, right then. Um, thank you very much, Mike, on behalf of everyone here and the BCS Emma Committee. Can we show our final gratitude of thanks to Mike? Thank you.